we go. And now it is officially recording. All right. Uh, everybody who's watching, this is the uh, fifth episode of Imposter Syndrome now. Excellent. And this is Thomas J. Beleza. Hi, I'm Thomas J. Beleza. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, Mr. Michael uh, J. Kelly. Yes, yes. Well, I uh, only ever Mike. Nobody calls me Michael. Oh, all right, just never. Mike. Mike. Never, never Michael. Now, do they always call you Jay for your middle name, or do they know that it's not really Jay? N nobody uses that. I, I, that's purely for professional purposes. The J. But what's it stand uh, for? Like, you know, James. James. Yeah. Michael James. Oh, that's very Irish of you. Or German. What are you, German? It's, it's Irish. There's Irish. a little bit of little bit of German in me. But. Isn't there always a little bit of German in everyone? Well, I mean, yeah, they settled the U.S. quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, most Germans, the only thing they can afford to put in you is a little. <laughs> and this is recorded. <laughs> Sorry to our German audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sprechen Sie Deutsch, ja? Nein, sprechen Sie Deutsch? Yep. I learned that at the Universität with my cousine. <laughs> so, uh, tell us a little about yourself. Oh, the background. God, I love that question. Yeah, well, me too. You, what do you want to know about myself? I don't know. Well, uh, just... Like, like why you... do you ask that question? Like, what is the importance of it? Because, well, anybody who's listening to it should have an idea of what you do. What's your, what's your, I mean, I know you do a bunch of different things, so it's like, it's hard to pin you down. Well, you tell me, what do I do? <laughs> you direct, you have a, you run a, your own production, production, production company. <laughs> this is live. It's being recorded. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, you have, you used to be in the band or actually two bands, right? You said? Well, I'm still in a band, but oh, okay. I've, I've been in do several you, bands my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. But you used to be more of a touring musician, mm -hmm. and then you switched over to film, and you act as well. So you kind of a, a kind of a renaissance man, and a little stand up too. I do. I sit. Well, I sit down mostly now because my legs are too weak. But uh, yeah. I have been. I have been known on occasion to do some stand. -up. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. I do those things. I do that. But that isn't who I am. You know, that's not uh, like when people ask. You know, tell me about yourself. You know, those are just bullet points of. You know, it's like when you're having a meeting, uh, you know, uh, uh, they go in for a job and they go, tell me about yourself. You know, they don't want to yeah. hear, I graduated from here, I did this, I spent, yeah. where, they're like, who are you as a human being, you know, and uh, yeah. that's not who I, that's not who I am, you know, it's yeah. just what I do. Just so, I, like, you're not really a musician, it's just what you do. You True. know, when you break it down, it just so happens you're, you're an, a talented musician and composer and you could do all these things, but that's not why people would hire you, right? They're not hiring you because you do those things. I would hope not. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I I don't ask too many to questions. They don't. I could prove okay. to you that they do not hire you because you are an art, a musician or a composer. Okay. Every job you got so far that paid or didn't pay, how did it come to you? Uh... Most of the time, word of mouth or meeting the person in person. Okay, so so far, event. so so far we haven't said anything about music. Yeah, which is yeah, it's true. You know, and uh, now the issue though is a lot of people, not like yourself, but who are musicians or artists or actors or anyone, they focus on what they do. And they hope it gets them, uh, you know, seen or, or hired. But no one wants to hire somebody that does something. They want to hire someone they can relate to. They want to hire someone they like. They want to hire someone they can comfortably communicate with. I mean, when it comes to composing, your job is to talk with the director or producer and come up with some sort of musical, th uh, you know, creation. Now, imagine you, they couldn't talk with you. Like, they just felt like you were an a-hole or you're hard to... You know, you just can't, uh, your experience doesn't allow you to comprehend what they're trying to tell you. What you're hearing them say is uh, they wanted to be more sorrowy, and that's mm. not really giving you anything. It's, you know, like why, you know, what is the emotional cue through it, you know? But luckily, yeah. you have the ability to sort of watch something and kind of make something out of it. But the point is, 
no one wants to work with anyone they can't just work well with. They don't want to work with someone yeah. they can't relate with or communicate with. So um, yeah. those Very word true. of mouths is because somebody said, hey, my buddy Mike, Mr. J. Uh, Kelly over there, uh, he's uh, easy to work with and uh, he's a nice guy, you know? And then, oh, uh, thank you. They, well, I'm just I'm, obviously this is an arbitrary example I'm making up from 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 nowhere. That's right. I'm really an asshole and I'm horrible to work with. That, that's true. That's true. Now uh, he has wonderful handshakes and excellent sandwiches. Um, <laughs> but that, that's the point, you know. Like uh, again, it comes back to tell us about yourself. You know why? Yeah. You named a lot of things I do, but that isn't necessarily who I am. And the same thing with yourself and other people. And that's sort of like what my company does is we we reallocate your brain from uh, being artist strong to business strong. And uh, we tell people when you're writing and creating, performing or uh, doing the art, be an artist. Don't even think about the business. Don't think, how can I sell this? That's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to put yourself and your passion, especially musicians. You know, I, I grew up with mu the music world. You know, that's how I made a living. And a lot of musicians that I've dealt with, I've heard them literally say, all right, we need to make this song four and a half minutes, uh, just under four and a half minutes. And uh, we have to do verse, verse, uh, chorus, verse, chorus, chorus. And they go, why? And they go, because that's that's a hit. And it, that's not a hit. A hit yeah. is a hit because of that. You know, a hit is many, many things are involved uh, from uh, a record label buying a million um, copies of, of a single or uh, having relationships with record labels and, you know, becoming familiar with the music creates a uh, reaction in the brain and then our familiarity wants to hear it and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, uh, but I hear musicians, they try to write something that's going to sell. But the thing is, you have to put your passion, your heart, and everything that's true to writing into that song first. Yeah. So if the song ends up being nine minutes long, like uh, Images and Words uh, Pull Me Under, you know, yeah. that was their first single. Dream Theater, by the way, for yeah, people Dream who Theater, don't know. Dream My favorite Theater. band. <laughs> yeah, Images and Words, Dream Theater song was Pull Me Under. Their first single was nine minutes long pull me under and uh they were they were they still are a progressive rock band right so just to put that into perspective that's everything outside of what a, a single should be it's yes. literally the opposite of what a single should be it shouldn't be or look at what stairway to heaven the, one of the biggest songs of all time that song has it's eight minutes has no real structure or at least no typical structure and it's just an evolving structure. And that was one of the gr greatest, biggest hits of all time. Yeah, it's like one of the most uh, requested songs. Funny thing, though, the first time they played it in concert, people were bored and walked out, went and got drinks, went to the bathroom. They said, like, the audience didn't even care. Wow. Because no one knew the song yet. Yeah. It wasn't like somebody, you know, a, a hit becomes a hit because of familiarity. Yeah. You're never going to see a band and be like, you know, that was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Because if that was the case, all the bands that opened up for the bands you went to see would have been bigger quicker. Mm. But they weren't. But there are some bands you're like, I remember watching that band when they opened up for, uh, you know, Pantera or Metallica or, you know, Queensryche. And then it turns out you love all their music, but they had played all those songs. You just didn't care at the time. And that's, yeah. brand, that's brand relationships. That's, that's brand value. That's brand, uh, that's an emotional connection to a brand, right? So, uh, but anyway, I'm, I, 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 uh, I digress. You digress. I digress. I digress. Yeah, that's that's all good points. Yeah, um, that's something. I, I I think as a musician, I've never had a real problem personally with that with that whole trying to make a song marketable, because I always had like a taste for like prog or like off the beaten path stuff. Yeah. Which is actually good because, like, I approach music, like, I don't, like, care at all, like, if somebody, like, doesn't like my music. Like, it doesn't offend me. Yeah. Cause, because I I already assumed that most people aren't going to like it. <laughs> so I'm just like, whatever, I just make this and hope if somebody likes it, great. But, you know. Yeah, but you're not supposed to be making music for people to like it. You're, exactly. You know, if you really want them to like it, then uh, you should focus on yourself. You know, music is a is a uh, byproduct of what you create. So they have to like you first. 
you know, R. Kelly's having a hard time selling music right now because it's getting taken out of the radio stations and everything because no one likes him anymore. This guy made millions and millions of dollars off of stupid songs, or at least songs that I personally think are stupid, but people bought into who R. Kelly was, and mm. they purchased his music. You know, um, the reason Michael Jackson was able to continue on after Jackson 5 is because people were more interested in Michael Jackson's story and who he was as a hero, as someone who overcame all this uh, turmoil and broke free from the Jackson 5 and became Michael Jackson. Now, why did he become Michael Jackson and Jackson 5 died out in the 80s? Like, no one cares about any of them. What's the difference? They're all the same people, right? They're, they're the same band, same parents, same, same uh, path to success. But Michael Jackson kept going, and they didn't. What was the big difference? He uh, he had that that star power, that that little extra something. That's incorrect. I just said. It. Uh, uh, well, no, well, he he had that. You know, people were interested in his story. People were interested, that, right, like you said. Yeah, that's right. In fact, you know, one of the things that uh, the I I don't know if you know the 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 theory going around. Michael Jackson has a deep voice, so a lot of people that uh, him. Castration theory. No, no, no. But uh, his close friends, I'll tell, I'll tell you why he does it. But his close friends tell him, you know, when Michael talks to you, he has a deep voice. He's like, yo, what's up, Chris? And they're like, who's this? And he's like, this is Michael Jackson. And, you know, Chris, you know, Chris Tucker was like, hey, Michael Jackson, you know. But he's like, he's like, you just don't know. But the reason is uh, because people want to hear the high voice on Michael Jackson because that's the brand relationship. They like to see him as a child. And that, a lot of people say that's part of the reason he never grew up because he had that psychological damage that people saw him as that child. They mm -hmm. saw him as the kid who broke free. They saw him as the kid that uh, accomplished the dreams that you always wanted, you know. And um, if you notice, he kept in those hee-hees and hoo hoos and like all, all those different sound effects because that was a part of his growing brand. People liked those things. So he had to do that, you know. Uh, he was by all means, an amazing artist, you know, but uh, the truth of the matter is the reason he went above and beyond the Jackson 5 is because the Jackson 5 didn't have an emotional connection to a greater audience. Mm. And, uh, you know, that's the secret to success is network market practice. You know, you got to build and cultivate your relationships for opportunities. You got to develop a brand to create awareness that builds interest that ultimately generates sales. So people buy emotionally into your message, your voice. And then, of course, you need to practice your skills and abilities so you know what you're doing. So when they call you up the bat, you can at least hit a damn single, you know, at minimum. And that's how you find yourself successful in this business, in any form, you know, whatever. Entertainment, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be a scientist, if you want to be a president of the United States, network market practice. Mm, good, good. Right. So, you know, I, I, um, the way I approach this is, is uh, I'm trying to get a little more into the actual people that I interview, like not not as much straight up business advice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, well, I want that part of it, but I kind of want to get into the deeper aspects of it. Um, and one of the things that has always stood out to me about you since I met you is like, you're like super, like super confident, like super charismatic. Like it's just like, I, I mean, the first time we met, it was at a, that networking event. You just walked up to me, hey, what's up, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, okay, well, that just happened. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> like, you just kind of appear. And like, I mean, I know a little bit about your your past as far as your, Ill, your previous illness. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, were you the same person? Uh, like, were you as confident before? The, the cancer or did that make a big change well uh i've always been pretty much the, like if you ask anybody that's known me for 20 30 years i've been pretty much the same since 16 except i have more hair on my chest okay uh but uh i've always been an introvert which you would think is that's impossible <laughs> but, yeah how's this guy an introvert yeah and i and I, I if i could make the choice or or the excuse to stay home i will it's just I have, you know, I, I don't like going out. I, I have trouble around people. So it was something I had to develop, you know, because I wanted to be successful in music. I dropped out of high school at 17, something like that. And, uh, 
I focused on music and it took me seven years to become successful in music, took me three years to retire from that point because I was in music for 10 years, right? And uh, it was just a conscious decision. I was like, well, nothing's coming my way. Just because I make music, people aren't going to be like, I need to hear that. Music. Like I need to, uh, I need to build relationships. I need to let people know I exist and I need to be able to do what I do, right? So um, I just made a conscious decision uh, to leave myself home <laughs> and when I go out, uh, you know, be the person I want to be, be the person. So I, I believe deeply in, uh, uh the misquoted, uh, Gandhi, uh, quote, the, um, uh, become the change that you want to see in the world, right? Become the change you want to see, right? Uh, which is a misquote of what he actually said. But anyway, uh, I believe in the misquote, become the change you want to see. Um, so some of the things I want to see in the world is I want to see people help one another more. Uh, another thing is I want to see people be comfortable talking to others. I want to see people being able to talk about anything, you know, without feeling uh, fearful of repercussions. As long as I, I do believe that you shouldn't uh, say things to hurt people. Uh, but again, we can't control what people are hurt by. But there's a difference between attacking someone and then, like, if you and I have a conversation about, say, uh, you know, let's say uh, my gay friend and somebody's offended that we're talking about someone who's gay. Well, that's on them, not us. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully like, we're not saying anything disparaging about that gay person. Though. No, no. We're like, oh, my, my friend, yeah. my friend, uh, you know, arbitrarily is a fake name. I go, my friend John, you know, he just started dating uh, this kid, Chris. And again, somebody goes, ah, oh, man, you stop talking about gay people. It upsets me. And it's like. You know, that's on you. Like, I I didn't say anything to offend that guy or that person. It just so happens they were offended. So, you know, I believe you should be able to talk about anything you want in this world as long as you don't purposefully direct it to hurt somebody. Yeah. You know? Uh, I agree so, 100%. Yeah. You know? And also, don't ever physically um, break contact with somebody unless they... Uh, or okay with it, you know, and that, that comes from fighting, anything, you know, sexual harassment, anything. Um, however, those are the, those are just three of the many things I wanted to see in the world that, that I wish, you know, I wish people had said yes to me more when I was growing up. So I became the yes guy. I became the guy that, uh, you know, you know that I used to own a theater for like three years. And uh, my biggest thing was I always said yes. I said, oh, you want to do a show here? First time writer, first time director? Yes. Like I was the open... I wanted to open doors. So for me to, like you said, you know, you saw me as confident, friendly, you know, I, it's not that I'm confident. It's just, I know what I want. I know what I want to see people do. And I want to become that inspiration for others to be that mechanism that, that uh, it's okay to talk to people. That's why we did the, uh, the team rise together events. And uh, even, even though we've kind of slowed down on those because of my, you know, when I got sick, uh, that's definitely something I want to start bringing back and do more often. It's because we want an environment where people meet up and don't say, I'm a writer or I'm an actor. I, we want people to meet up and say, hi, my name is. And have people get to know each other because that's what it's about. Again, it's not what you do. It's who you are, which is mm -hmm. more important. So, uh, you know, to answer your question, no, I wasn't always as I am now. Uh, uh, or different than I was because of cancer. I just created this persona that became my truest form. You know, like it became who I am, even though I still have these anxieties, and even though I have this introvert uh, aspect to me, even though that I, you know, don't like going out and stuff like that. That gives yeah. me hope because that's where I am. I'm very much the same way. Like I. If I could stay home all, all the time, I could. Because, like, when somebody invites me out to a party, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> it, it feels like a chore. And, like, I'll, I'll get to the party, and then I actually can get very animated and fun to be around for a while. But that drops off quick. Yeah. I, I'm slowly increasing my tolerances, but it's, 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 a, it's a struggle. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, bring uh, donuts or uh, candies. Yeah. That always helps. You know, yeah. you just throw that at people, and that that really makes it everyone. Take a donut. Yeah. <laughs> Love me. <laughs> just put it away. 
you know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I see you. I mean, you came to uh, every uh, Team Rise together that you knew about. You came to um, – I've seen you at events, you know. But you also have to pick and choose the right events, you know, and you're not going there to sell who you sell what you do. You got to go there to sell who you are. And I think that's also a part of the anxiety. Like if you go like you went to that film event, the film industry where I met you yeah. and, you know, you were there to get work as a composer, mm -hmm. which in turn is already a wall. It's already an anxiety. Like, am I good enough to even be a composer? Uh, you know, I've never really done work work. I've only done like small projects. And will these people even consider me like, you know, I have no like you're you're just beating yourself up. But you know what? No one knows who you are as a person. So it's a it's a clean slate. It's literally the beginning of a hello. You, you know, there's nothing you can say that's going to make them hate you. You're not because they're not buying anything from you. They're just getting a hello and they're hearing how you input. And, you know, that's the brilliance of uh, not knowing someone is a stranger gets to start over every time. Whereas, you know, with a, with somebody, you know, like even if you haven't seen them in 10 years, they know you as what they last seen you as. So yeah. <laughs> even your elevation of yourself becomes like maybe a deterrent, you know, um, that's why I, I believe in the rule, you know, be nice to everyone because you don't know who someone is and who someone knows not to benefit your career or self, but it's who just better. Be. Yeah. yeah, it's just better to be nice. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm always, I've always been good about that. Like, I've always been naturally like nice to people. Yeah. But like, I'm also so insecure. It's something I'm very paranoid about, and like, I'm constantly afraid that I'm not nice to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's uh, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm automatically a very agreeable person, and actually, that's something I'm working on is to be slightly less agreeable right now, because it's kind of, I've, I've been too agreeable. Yeah. And it's hurt me in a lot of aspects of my life. So. Well, you know, something you could always think of doing is, um, you know, it's, it's, look. I always tell people, whenever you go somewhere, do five to ten minutes of wallflowering. You know, just be a part of the scene. Don't interact with it. Listen to people. Pay attention to people. Figure out the value of people. Not in a sense of like, what can they do for you? But like the value as in like, you know, uh, who's bringing the most energy? Who's, uh, you know, who's adding? You know, because you don't want to go hang out with the negative people. Because it's not going to help you. You want to hang out with people that are... So, have you ever heard me talk about the circle of influence? Yeah. yeah. So, the circle of influence isn't necessarily people who could influence your career. They're people that influence their own life and inspire others around them just by being who they are. You know, and you want to find influential people because they're going to grow who you are. You're going to just want to elevate to their level just because... You know, like, oh, I love how happy they always are. Or, I love how happy people are around them. Or these people always get things done. And you just start, uh, you know, developing their their uh, habits, which is important. You know, if, if you hang out with people that play video games all the time, not that there's anything wrong with playing video games. But if you want to have a career as an actor and, and all you do is hang out with people that play video games, that's what you're doing. You're playing video games. You're not out there with other actors. You're not out there being within that field of interest you're just hanging out with video game people which is fine if that's what you want to do you know but uh so you have to what i do is i do the wallflower for like five to ten minutes and i find the right circles or i find people that um uh need motivation right so so you're an example someone i saw i was like oh that person needs motivation they, they seem like out of place here and you know i walked over and i gave you a boost and it helped you know like yeah you ended up meeting like four other people, I think, just by being around me. Like they yeah. just gravitated towards us and stuff like that. And uh, you know, that that that's a uh, that's a trick, but it's it's something to help inspire someone to break those barriers, you know, the, those insecurity barriers. And the other thing is, when you're having a conversation, there there are two people. There's an alpha and a beta, right? Even if you're an alpha, you have to make that beta an alpha. You got to give them the floor because it's not about you. Everything in life is not about you. It's about everyone else. You know, you've never, ever had a best friend where someone asked them, why are you best friends with Mike? 
And they go, oh, you know, I love Mike. He lets me listen to him complain all the time and tell me about his day. No, it's the exact opposite. Why are you, for, you know, why is Mike your best friend? Mike's my best friend because he listens to me. I feel comfortable being myself. You know, he'll hear me out. He, he's good counsel, right? So that is what you're trying to do within two, three, four, five, six minutes of a first introduction is be that best friend. Listen and respond. So if you're listening, you can't insult them because you're not saying anything insulting. And then if you respond to what they're saying without trying to up them or create a, a sense of you, you're not going to insult them. You know, the moment someone says, oh, yeah, I've been working in film and, uh, you know, I just did this project. If your response is, you know, I'm a composer. You probably insulted them, but not in a way you think you did. You insulted them because you didn't listen to them. It's about you now. And that's how you say to yourself, well, I don't want to insult people. So let me listen. I don't need them to know about me unless they ask. And the moment they ask, how are you going to insult them? Oh, well, tell you know, what do you do? Are you, what, what do you do in the business? Oh, I'm a composer. How's that insulting? Mm, yeah, very you know? good. So you let them control the conversation, but in reality, you're controlling it because you're moving within what their parameters are. You know, and uh, people think the more you talk, obviously I'm being interviewed now, so I, I am talking, but uh, people think the more I talk, the more control I have in a conversation, but that's not true. Your yeah. answers to someone talking has more control over the direction of the conversation than the actual conversation itself. That's actually what I like about this medium is because I'm the interviewer, quote unquote, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm kind of forcing myself to be in that, put myself in that subordinate position mm -hmm. where I'm, I'm actually, even though I'm the one running this, I have to make it all about the person I'm interviewing and uh and that helps me in the back end eventually hopefully yeah. <laughs> uh one day um but uh yeah and one of the great values i'm getting out of this is that i can listen back and kind of audit myself how i handled the conversation so like Oh, I was being a little bit of a prick there. I got to back <laughs> off on that on the next episode. <laughs> you, but you could be a prick. Yeah. You understand? Like, people love pricks as long as the prick is listening and responding. If you're being That's a, true. if you're not listening to what's being said, you know, then you're being more than a prick, even when you're not being a prick. You know, like, if you listen to me, I say pretty uncomfortable things. You know, but because I established relationships with people, not only did I understand who I am and the value of what I bring to a conversation or a relationship, and not not I'm a great person, but like the value of like, you know, it's good to know him because, you know, I, I do get something out of it. I get a I get camaraderie out of him and I know that he'll always be there for me and I there's loyalty involved in knowing him and stuff like that, right? So you know, being a prick is one thing, but as long as you give value to that relationship, uh, well, here's an example. You know what TAC is, the Art of Conversation, T-A-C? No. All right. So the Art of Conversation is something that uh, I developed basically like 10 years ago, and, I, and I've and i been teaching it and, and speaking at colleges, and I, I, I talk about TAC, right? So there's a point system in conversation. It's plus one, minus one. So obviously... You want pluses. You want to get plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. You know, just keep going up. Um, so when you're listening and responding, if your response is about you, that's called upping. And that's a negative point. So if I say to you, hey, Mike, I just uh, I just got a dog. You know, look at my dog. And I show you a picture. And your response is, oh, you, you know, I have a dog. It looks My dog's a German. My dog looks nothing like your dog. But I do have it. You just got a negative one. So already I'm uninterested in you as a human being, subconsciously. You're devaluing yourself. But if you go, oh, that's a beautiful dog. Uh, you know, what is it? What is that? Four or five months old? And you go, yeah, 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 yeah. He's, a four, he's four months old. You know, I just got him. He's a, right. And you go, oh, what kind of what kind of puppy breed is that? You know, and you're like, oh, it's a raw You know, and if you say, um, if you go, uh, you know, did you adopt it or, or did you uh, did you buy it? And I go, oh, I bought it. And you go, oh, that's great. You just got three or four points in there. Right, because there were three questions, so that's three points. Okay, and none of it was about you. Now, of course, if you said, "Did you buy it or, or adopt it?" 
And I go, oh, I bought it. And you go, oh, you know, you should always adopt. You just got a negative point. Mm. So you got plus two, minus one, right? So now you're at one point of this relationship, right? And not that you should be thinking about that when you're talking, but ultimately that's what every relationship is, plus one, minus one, you know? And uh, so you could be a prick if you have a high plus. Like if you have 40 points in, invested in that relationship over the course of time be, through conversation, you can be a prick. You're allowed negatives as long as you don't go past zero, but also you don't want to be like plus five because that's not really a strong relationship. Mm. And the way attack works is look at your relationships with say your best friend that you've had for 10 years versus somebody you've known for a year. There's certain things you can ask for, do and request uh, uh, or, or even not do for that 10 year friend versus the one year friend. Right? Because you have yeah. that built relationship. You can literally go to a 10 year friend and be like, dude, I need uh, I need rent. And uh, you know, I wouldn't ask it. And they'd they'd be like, Absolutely, man. What do you need? Three, four, five hundred bucks? I know you're good for it. But you can't do that to that one year friend unless like you really built those points up. Right? So yeah. that's what the power of tack is. So I wouldn't think of it like, how do I not be a prick, even though, you know, you shouldn't be a prick, but you should think about relationship building and not so much about you. You know, what should I say? What should I should say? No, just listen and respond. That's your, that's your foundation. As long as you can listen and respond to what's being said, you're already ahead of the game. Okay. That, I, I like the way you put that. Yeah. That, that, that clarified it better. Yeah. Well, it's like a woman, you know, you, 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 you take her out on a date, right? And uh, what do they hate the most? When you talk about yourself. You talk about yourself. <laughs> so why would someone you're not on a date with feel any different? It's true. It is a relationship after, after all. It's just not an intimate relationship or the potential for an intimate relationship. You know, so every relationship you meet is a relationship. Because you could end up loving somebody that you're friends with. Even if they're a guy or a girl, it doesn't matter. It's it's a love of appreciation based on point growth. You know, the way those conversations go. Have you ever had a friend for five years and you're just like, I got to end this friendship, man. It's just, I got to end it. Yeah. I mean, to some extent. I, I don't know if I've ever, like, ended a relationship I think any, like, it's really, it's usually been, well, one, but it was, they ended it with me. But, um. <laughs> Maybe you are a prick. <laughs> in that instance, yes. <laughs> we won't get into it. Yeah. But, um, uh, most of my, any kind of, like, friendships that I've had that, like, didn't work out were, like, it just kind of faded off. It's like high school friends that you don't keep up with, stuff like that. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, yeah. those relationships, they just never put in the right amount of points. They were always just whatever whatever it was that made it negative, where it's like, I'm not even going to put time into that relationship anymore, and it's going to fade away. And that's where your circle of influence comes in. You know, the five people you hang out with the most become the world you live in, right? Yeah. So, you know, obviously, you want to put more time into people that, you know, inspire you, that elevate you. Yeah. Actually, I did recently have to cut somebody out. Uh, did you do it with a knife? Right. Yes. No. No, more with a letter, but yeah. And that that is, that was the first time I ever had to do that. And especially when it's somebody that's close to you, that's a yeah. pretty, it's a rough thing, but there are some people that are, you know, they can be kind of parasites. Like oh, yeah, absolutely. Energy parasites, and you just... As much as you don't want to do it, you have to cut him out. <laughs> That's what I have to cut you out. Why? Uh, you're like a vampire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's hard. It's a really hard thing to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, like, I don't... It's something I put off for years, and I don't blame other people who have similar situations for getting caught in it. Because it's something for... From the outside, people might be like, "Why, why can't you just sever that relationship?" It's like, it's not that easy. 
Yeah, especially it's you know you got to look at a like a, a you know abusive relationship, intimate or not. You know, it's the same thing. You're just connected to these familiar uh, territories where it's just like, well, you know, if I don't have this person in my life, I have to literally change my pattern. Mm-hmm. You know, every week for the last year or two years, I've been going to this one place where they are. And if I cut them out, then do I go to that place? Do I not go to that place? You know, like that's the problem with uh, even breaking up with somebody in a relationship is if you have a long period of relationship with them, you're not just breaking up with them, you're converting your habits and patterns, which is anxiety. You know, somebody once uh, said, uh, you know, because I do a lot of research and watch videos and read. Uh, it was a guy who said, um, he's like a motivational speaker. He says, you know, change itself isn't difficult. You know, anyone can change. It's just the act to change is difficult. You know, to do is the hardest thing uh, in the world because of the anxiety or the fear of the change. But change itself, I mean, you know, when you, there's levels of fear. Like, see how you're sitting right now in your Mm -hmm. chair? If you sat up more, that's a change in your life. It's just, you don't see... But you, but now your posture is different, right? And you're affecting yeah. your health. But that's not something that is intimately drastic for you. It's not life altering, but it's still a change. And we place the fear upon our changes to mm-hmm. do or not do. Uh, you know, and again, it comes down to, like you said, confidence earlier, I have. It's not confidence. It's just the, the choice to be willing to do. And, uh, you know... Um, Like one of the things I always, one of my mantras is, uh, you know, finding your yes, you know, or uh, making things happen by making things happen, you know, be proactive in life. Like that's the truth. We can't do anything unless we choose to do it. You can't stop being an alcoholic unless you choose to do it. That's one of the big things. You can't force them to go get rehab, you know, like they have to choose to do it. The same with anything. You have to choose to make changes. You have to choose to have a career. You know, like, like uh, for example, have you ever met anyone who wants to be something uh, in entertainment? Like, they want to be a musician or they're an actor or a writer, and uh, but they have a day job. But it's a good day job. You know, they make $25 to $30 an hour. They've been with the company for, like, six years. You know, they're moving up the corporate line, and they're just like, oh, how do I leave this job? You know, I can't – I don't make any money. But if they put the same amount of time and effort into their desired, passionate career – they would actually make more money doing it for themselves than if they continue working for the corporation. You know, and if you don't believe that, I mean, 311 makes uh, $150,000 a show. So, you know. Yeah, that's... That's, that's one show for maybe two hours. <laughs> wow. So, you know, divided by four people. <laughs> so you do the math. Unless they have a 360 deal, then that's getting chopped off quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, uh, your money from performing is not greater than your money of licensing. But no musician that makes a fortune makes it from music. So even Metallica is not making it because they're musicians. I mean, they made, uh, I think it was like almost $10 million dollars. It might have been a little bit more on the Black Tour, but they all ended up with $2 million. Now, in retrospect, that's a terrible percentage of money. You know. Yeah, when you think about how successful that record was, I would have expected more. Yeah, well, that's Especially just... Especially at the tour. time. That was just the tour, uh, though. That's four years nonstop, $2 million a person. Some people started off married. They ended up divorced. But the way they make money is they reincorporate that money into op, uh, diversifying. You know, like like you know me, you said it earlier, you go, I write, I act, I do music, I have a production company, I consult. That's because I diversify my income. So when one area is slow, another area is not. That's just mathematics, right? So if you look at Metallica and all the members of Metallica, they all have side companies. I mean, Lars just made, well, not just, but he made a million dollars on a painting. You know, and it was black canvas with some red on it, and it made a million dollars. Now, to be fair, it's because his name is Lars, and people wanted it because it was a Metallica painting, which is brand 
grow. That's a brand development, right? That's brand value. So people bought the, they paid a million dollars for his brand value, right? Uh, but still, he made a million dollars from a painting that probably took him two hours, three, four, maybe five hours to do, right? Let's just assume, right? That's half of what he made playing with Metallica for four years with the Black Album. Yeah. Do you see, do you see uh, how it works? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyone that tells you, I want to make a living as an actor, you know, you just, okay, you know, it's, it's never going to, you might make a living, but you won't make a lifestyle. Do you know what the difference is? Yeah. Especially since it's, it tends to be gig to gig, so you have, have to have something else to rely on to supplement it. Well, I mean, the rule, the rule in acting or music is like, while you're on stage or while you're performing, you should be looking for your next gig, right? But, uh, or you should have several gigs lined up, you know, like when bands are like, we just had a show in June. And you're like, when's your next show? We, we don't have one. Well, then why did you play this show? You know, if you're going to play one show a year, there's no reason to play a show at all. So you should try to just focus on setting up a short tour around your, like, if you live in New York City, you should play New York City, Long Island, Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and, and maybe uh, Rhode Island, right? So, and you do a show a week, you know, and then uh, by the time you finish that short tour, you should be doing another show back in New York, Long Island, like you keep the rotation going. So you're basically, if you're playing at six or seven different spots or states, right, it's going to take you seven months to get back to New York City. But in that time, you're growing your, your, uh, your brand value and your uh, awareness, right? So brand awareness. It's the same thing with actors, you know, they'll focus on like, let me audition, 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 auditions, but auditions don't get you work. You know, like they say, oh, if I could get 10 auditions, I'll get work. And it's like, no, that's not what's getting you work. You know, focus on building your relationships because people will be like, oh, I want you in this. I want you in this part. So, yeah, you can audition and get a role. You can get cast by auditioning. But if you focus on auditions, you're not focusing on getting cast. You're focusing on getting auditions. But an audition doesn't get you cast. Now you got to go in. You got to make sure you know your part. You got to make sure you know your characters. You have to have good choices. You got to whatever, right? But again, the more the casting people know who you are, the more interested they are in hiring you. They're more to go to bat to someone they believe in instead of somebody they just met. Mm. You know, uh, you know who Vince Vaughn is? Yes. Vince Vaughn uh, auditioned for a role. I forget what movie it was, but he auditioned for a role. He did a little research, found out the director was going to be in the room. And the director liked the Jets. And he's not really a Jets fan, Vince Vaughn. But he went in, and when the guy said, oh, you know, how you doing? You know, how was your weekend? He goes, ah, the Jets just lost, man. And I'm just, it's just killing me. And he's like, I know! The director starts going, I can't believe they lost! And they built a, rela a rapport, like, super quick. And then he did the audition. He didn't get the part. But months later, he said that director called him out and said, hey, I got a role for you. I want you to do it. So he built that relationship with the director and the director just by knowing who he was in that connection. Wouldn't you say that's slightly fake though, because he, you said he wasn't really a Jets fan. All right. Well, let me ask you a question. When you are asked to do a job, mm -hmm. okay. To do a composition for a movie, right? Are you more prone to be agreeable to what they're looking for before you even know how to do it? Oh, true. Absolutely. Well, that's yeah. a lie. That's true. If I, if I say to you, hey, look, I'm looking for this, 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 and this, and you have no idea what this, 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 and this is, and you go, yeah, no, I, I could do that. I've done that before. To get the so, job. Yeah. Because you're a salesperson. Sale, you're selling your product, and he, his product is his, his brand, his, his person. Because he acts, right? So he has to sell it as, as best he can. You understand? So it's yeah. not that he's lying. He's just, there's tools to sell yourself in this business. There's no way you go into a business meeting wearing a suit and think you're not lying. Yeah, that's true. Especially if you spend your entire weekend in sweatpants. Yeah, that's most of my weekends. Okay. So <laughs> anytime you dress up, you're preparing to lie. Yeah. When you when you shave your beard and clean it up, you're lying. Mm. You know, because 
whatever your status quo is, if you go against that to impress somebody or to fill the part or to make them look at you a certain way, you're lying. Yeah. So, yes, I agree. It is lying. But that's what we do in this business. It's selling. Yeah. You're, you're, you, the only thing you have to be honest about is who you are and your integrity, integrity to who you are and what you do. So, yes, you're saying, I know how to do that music. But the integrity is that you will learn how to do that music and you will bring them a good product. Or you'll say, you know what, I try and I can't do this. Here's your money back. Like, that's the integrity. Yeah. You know, like you have to be you have to be right by who you are. But, you know, sometimes you got to say you can do something. You know, there, there's this old saying is like, say yes to everything. Figure it out later. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so. it's, it's it's kind of like a, a better version of uh or a more articulate version of fake it till you make it oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. fake it till you yeah. make it right so you know although yeah. i think people misunderstand that quite a bit that phrase well like how, they, so? how so well i I'll, like because like for me fake it till you make it is like the example you just said of oh yeah i i, I could pull i could pull off that kind of music yeah. Even though in my head I'm like, ah, I don't know how to play country. <laughs> but um, but but like uh, the other one is like people go on and show off themselves sitting next to a Lamborghini that they rented. Oh. <laughs> like next, and wait, throwing around a bunch of money to show like, oh look at, I'm this rich entrepreneur, but they rented all of it and it's all fake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so there's pretty, like, there's uh... the... oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was saying there's the good fake it till you make it. There's the bad fake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there, the mentality of fake it till you make it was uh, originally a positive uh, presentation where they said, you know, you have to make like you're successful already. So wear a suit every day. You know, even though you're not really wealthy, you wear a suit every day because you're trying to inspire yourself to be better every day. You know, um, it's like uh, like you work from home, right? Doing composition, like you don't have an office or anything, right? Yeah, my my room is my office. That's what I'm saying, it's right? Like two in one. But uh, at any point in the day, do you sit on your bed while you're working? Nope. You stay in your chair, right? Yeah. Yeah, because you got to create different workspaces. So by being in the chair, you're faking it in a sense. You're like, oh, I'm in my office. That's okay. true. Yeah, you, like I guess the first quadrant of my room is my office. The second half is yeah, is your living quarters. So it's the same thing. You know, that's really what fake it till you make it was meant to be. Is just become that success. Like live successfully within your means until you become successful. You know, but um, you know, obviously you want to live on a budget. You know, that's that's the difference between lifestyle and and a living. You know, a living is within a budget that you create. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't afford to uh, do A, B, and C. And it's like, well that's outside your budget so what can you do within your budget what yeah. are you capable of doing within your budget to work to build your budget higher because if you work within your budget to at least create a, a savings or create like a, a um you know roi a return on your investment of self you know you're uh you're going to create opportunity because now you have money to play with and that money you could play with. You can start doing other things. You could start investing it. You start creating security. You could even reward yourself. Whereas some people, they don't have the extra money and they go on vacation. Then when they get home, what's the problem? Well, now they have no money and they got to work even harder to pay for their bills. Right. Mm. But, uh, you know, if you learn how to budget and you learn how to organize your money and you learn how to work the three needs of purpose, you know, now everything changes, but, you understand what the 60-40 split is and yada, yada, yada. So, you know, uh, there's a lot involved in building a career. Like you're, you're a composer, but that's a career. And, you know, just working on projects isn't going to give you a career. It's just, yeah. you know, you could do that. If you're willing to do something for free, which is not a bad thing, uh, then it's, it's not really a career. The career is like people know who you are and they go to you. That's a career. Do they pay you? Sometimes, sometimes not. But if you're trying to find uh, the work through work, where you're like, you know, you ever hear that? Oh, work, work brings you work. And it's like, no, it doesn't. No, work, no, it doesn't. <laughs> work will never, ever bring you work. Because if you do a movie and someone hears the score and they go, I love that, 
The only way they're going to know is if you marketed yourself correctly. You have an IB, ID, uh, IMDb. You have a website. You, uh, you're connected to the people that actually did the film. So then they go, oh, who did your sound, your score? And then the people go, oh, Mike Kelly. And now that's networking. So now marketing and networking and your ability to practice what you do got you work. But that job didn't get you work. Your practice to be as good as you are got them to listen. Then because you did your real job, which is network market practice, you have your marketing out there and you have your network relationships building. That allowed you more work. But if you just focused on like, oh, I was in a movie, you know, I acted in this uh, college movie, I'm making it, you know, and then you don't, no one's going to hire you because they saw you on that. Yeah, I can honestly say almost everybody that's ever hired me never actually listened to my prior music. <laughs> like, like because, because they like you. Yeah, or if they did, it's like for a couple seconds. Like, I, you can kind of tell when you're talking to somebody that they didn't actually listen to your music. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, like when I came to you, I definitely listened to your music, but uh, but like for example, you know, like you know, we we asked you to do the music on that the uh, grave remorse, right? But in turn, you asked me to do your logo, and then you were like, "How much?" And I was like, "What?" Like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna charge you. Like, yeah. you're doing us a solid. You're doing something that is your livelihood. You know, I'm not gonna charge you for to do. You know, to, but I also believe in that. I believe people should work together. So what we did is something yeah. I believe in, even though we didn't pay each other. You know, your your excellence. Uh, not only makes me tell other people and they're more likely to pay you, but as we grow and I need more composition and more money is in the project, the more money you make, you know, like I pay the people that are loyal to me and the company. So uh, like all the time I get people that reach out to me and go, I have this project, you want to produce it? And I go, it's this much money. And they go, that's ridiculous. Can't you just license it? And I was like, so you want me to pay you to license your script and then you want us to stop the projects we're working on that all of us in the company is passionate about. But we don't know who you are. No, I'm not going to put money into someone I've never met. Mm. That's why I would rather take a risk with the people I'm involved with than the people I've never met. And that's what a lot of people don't understand when they reach out to producers or production companies or even studios. When they're like, look, uh, I don't have a name. I don't have any awards, but I have these three scripts that are freaking amazing, awesome, and unique, and I really think you should take them because they're going to sell. Well, why are they going to sell? How many other films have you done that sold? None. Okay. So where's the, where's the evidence? And then if they turn around on me and say, well, how many have you done? I go, but every project I've done, we've done on budget. We've completed. We filmed. We had fun doing it, and we grew our team. Like, mm. it was for us. Like, we didn't have to put any money above and beyond what we, we put money into, you know. But you're asking me to give you, uh, you know, this, 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 and this, and no one knows who you are. No one knows who we are either, but we're being proactive making our own projects, you know. I, I, but more, more than just having a thing. Like, you have to remember, writing music, creating a CD for a band is not how you get noticed, you know. Because if you don't have a fan base, no one even wants to hear the music. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. How many times have you been in the car with the radio on and you heard a song you never heard and you left it on? Yeah. It's a small it's a small fraction of the of the reality. It's like maybe you heard the beginning lick and you were like, that's interesting. And then it's like, uh, this is crap. And you turn it off because you're not familiar with the brand. Yeah, and sometimes you have to hear that same song on the radio five times before it actually clicks. Exactly. Yeah. And usually it's because your friend won't change it because they like it. And now you're yeah. in the car listening to it and then they like it and you trust their judgment. So you actually give it a real listen. You know, yeah. and you're like, yeah, this song ain't that bad. And that's why, you know, Beyonce's famous. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, Beyonce's definitely an artist that I, I have a, a, a deep respect for, but I don't actually listen to her music. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah. it's good that you have respect for them. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, why do you? I mean, I think she's an amazing. Ah, she a well, I think she's a, no, I think she's a fantastic singer. Um, and it's just her, her actual. It's like 
I appreciate the talent of her musicianship. It's just her actual music does nothing for me. When it's it comes kind of, on, you go, oh, 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 oh. But, you know, that's the thing. In the right setting, I probably will, because I've heard that song enough. Um, same with um, the best example of that is Don't Stop Believing by Journey. I can't stand Journey. But if I'm in a public place <laughs> where dancing is expected of me, yeah. and that song comes on, I am with everybody else going, Don't Stop Believing. <laughs> Hold on to your feet. Yeah, funny. funny story about Journey. Did you know the guitarist who started Journey and the P the original piano player for Journey who was the organ player, actually played for Santana. Really, I didn't yeah. know that. And the guitarist was like sixteen or something when he played with Santana. Shit. Yeah. Wow. That actually, that's that's kind of like with Lemmy from Motorhead. He started out roading for uh, Jimi Hendrix. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I was shocked when I heard that. Oh, what? I was shocked when I heard that. Well, you know, it's Lemmy. You know, it's Cocoa Puffs. Yeah. Like, go here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Jimi Hendrix started out with um, uh, the guy who was saying, Wap, ba, ba, loo, ba, ba, wap, bang, boo, ba, 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 I think you and me are both too white to try to do a Little Richard impression. Yeah, yeah well, I think Little Richard was too white to do a Little Richard. But uh, <laughs> the reason he fired Jimi Hendrix was because Jimi Hendrix was outperforming him. Because Jimi Hendrix would be playing behind his head and stuff like that. And he's yeah. like, ah, I'm the show, boy! <laughs> That's what he would tell yeah. when That's, he used to get interviewed. That's uh, what happened with uh, Metallica and Guns N' Roses, too, right? Or, no, was it? It was Guns N' Roses, and there was another band where it was like, L.A. R Guns. I don't know. Well, what what's your uh, what's your? Uh... I, it was it was one band. I think, it, or maybe it was Black Sabbath. No, what? it wasn't Black Sabbath. I don't know, whatever. Bring up your point. I I tell you what. It band. was it, it was one band that was big, was headlining, and then the band before it was so good, the audience was trying to get them back on and didn't care about the headliner. That was Metallica opening up for Ozzy Osbourne. They were on tour together, and uh, Metallica had to leave the tour and do their own tour because Ozzy couldn't follow them. Oh, uh, okay. Why did I think that was Guns N' Roses? I don't know, but they're not that good. Uh, and then <laughs> uh, Kiss opened up for Black Sabbath, and uh, people couldn't even... It was too much for them. Like, they were just like, this is insane. Like it was, they were bigger. They were bigger than Black Sabbath before they were bigger than Black Sabbath. It's crazy. But uh, if I remember correctly, Kiss only did a couple of shows and then they got signed by accident. Oh really? Yeah, some guy who liked, uh, who knew Gene Simmons, uh, was uh, this guy was dating another guy who ended up signing them uh, as a management, and uh, he was like, "Let's go to the show. My buddy's band is playing," and he's like, "I don't want to go to a rock show," you know. And then he was like, please. So then, like, they went there, and he was like, holy crap, I got to sign these guys. <laughs> Did they, were they already doing the theatrical part at that point? Yeah, yeah. That's okay. all. Yeah. Funny story about Alice Cooper. I could be wrong on this, but this has been the story since I was a small child. My brothers told me. My cousins have told me. And uh, my research has shown uh, similar facts to it. But Alice Cooper, they were signed solely on their stage show. And then the record label told them to basically learn how to play their instruments, so they were going to drop them. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> and do. it worked out. <laughs> fake it till you make it. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, uh, I, I know uh, Nikki Six from Motley Crue was like historically like a bad, terrible bass player when they first started the band. Oh, but yeah. as they got bigger, he became a much better player and like sure. came to the. <laughs> He, he rose to the occasion. I I guess when you pedal on two or three strings. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You got to be pretty bad if you can't play well in, in uh, Motley Crue. The hardest part about being in Motley Crue is keeping up with like, Mars. Vicky, uh, what's his um, Mick, uh, Mick the other guitarist. The, you know, what's his name? The no, guitarist. it's Mick Mars. Yeah, yeah Mick Mars. Like yeah. I, I can't remember if it was Vinny or Mar That guy, even though he's playing with Motley, he's like a solid guitarist oh yeah there's a lot of those bands that have like a ridiculously good guitar player that doesn't deserve to be in that band oh yeah uh, yeah uh, another one is um 
Black Veil Brides. They're a more modern band. And they, they actually started out as, like, one of those emo bands. But they transitioned into, like, uh, like a modern, actually that kind of glam, like the Motley Crue kind of sound. Yeah. But, and I never liked their music at all. But their guitar player is amazing. <laughs> like, I'm like, damn, if you could only be in a different band. I shouldn't be shitting on them. <laughs> you, well, you know who uh, David Lee Roth is, right? Oh, of course. When he uh, got fired from Van Halen, he basically got the best musicians you could think of to play with him. I mean, you know, Steve Vai, his guitarist. And Steve Vai is playing this, like, ridiculously stupid music. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, like, yeah. the greatest guitarist, you know, in the world. The David Lee Roth solo stuff was, like, it was, de- for me, it's depressing. Like, did, Maybe. You ever, did you ever see the music video for Yankee Rose by him? <laughs> Son, I was done with uh, David Lee Roth before you knew what to do with David Lee Roth. <laughs> I, I, I remember I came across that music video, and it's just like, it's depressing. Like, it's cause it's like be. it's a, It's like a sad love ballad. No, n- not that at all. It's not a sad love ballad. It's, it's like, you know, happy, boisterous, like, oh, look how hot that chick is. It's when you watch the video, oh. it's like, it starts out, well, one, there's like so many like things that are like, well, this was a different time because you know, like very, very racist jokes. Oh <laughs> yeah, um, the 80s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it has this little skit in the beginning that's just terrible. It shows like like a Mexican couple in where like they just got married and the wife's pregnant and stuff like that, and like all these stereotypes. And then like gets into it, it's like they got like dick balloons or like <laughs> they use a micro like these giant inflatable microphones as dicks and stuff like. And in some contexts, that'd be funny, but. I watched that video. I'm just like, Ugh. it's just like it's it's sad. Uh, yeah, definitely it's too much. Time. Yeah, too much to buy. Back for then, you. it was good stuff because yeah. it was stupid. He was that's all he was. He was just stupid music. He was great music, like musicianship, but stupid. They just wanted to have fun. Yeah, you know, but uh, was, yeah. Well. yeah. So we're getting to oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Whatever. Uh, no, we're getting towards the end. Uh, so I was going to ask, I kind of asked the same questions at the end of the show. Uh, what is the thing that you feel holds you back the most in your career? And what do you think is your biggest strength or your greatest asset? The thing that holds me back the most in my career is, uh, uh, I would say, um, my faith in people because I'm loyal to a to a fault where like I'll fail with others uh, because they're not doing anything you know like like I'll put time into people for years and they'll fail and I'll take the fall with them I won't jump ship because I have I have hope I have faith in them that they actually care <laughs> so, yeah that's yeah that's, i think that, i have a little of that too yeah that's uh, i mean that's uh you know it's several several reasons in my life that uh you know kind of went the other way because of that and then what was the other question what, what do you think is the biggest like your biggest strength your a- biggest asset um almost the same thing i uh i care about people like uh like I, I legitimately want to help people to the point where I almost get taken advantage of far too much because of it. Like I, I just, I mean, I opened my theater and I did a free writing class every Wednesday and, you know, we'd pack out 20 to 50 people depending on the Wednesday, you know, and that was free. And then, uh, you know, um, I introduced people to people all the time or I had the theater because I wanted to, uh, you know, like I said earlier, say yes to people. I wanted to give people opportunity, you know, that's been my whole life. Like, because I, I had to work so hard to get where I was and so many people said no. And I'm just like, why are they saying no? Like, I don't understand, you know, there should be a division of, of labor, like to make money and a division of labor to help, you know, if it doesn't cost much to say yes, then just freaking say yes. You know, Mm. obviously if like, let's say I didn't know you and you came up to me and you're like, Hey man, I got this uh, play. I would like to, uh, you know, make it happen. 
I'm not going to put any money into that. But if I have an opportunity, like let's say my theater, to go, well, let's go ahead, put it on my stage. But don't expect to make any money. Like no one knows who you are. No one has never, you know, it's not like you're putting on a, if you put a Shakespeare play on, people will show up even if you barely market it. It's just because it's William Shakespeare. You know, if you put on like, like let's say you, um, you do like a, a, you know, a black box version of, you know, Aladdin. People are going to show up even if you barely market it. But if you're a no name and you market the crap out of it, people still probably won't show up because they'd be like, I never heard of this person. Like, what do I get? But, but I had that strength. I had that ability where I could give them like a Tuesday night or a Thursday night when we're not really using the theater. And I go, look, you could, you could have uh, the, the next four Tuesdays in April, you know, and then every Tuesday night they get to use the stage and put their play on, you know, for free. But, you know, the door split is 75-25. So if anyone shows up, we get 75, you get 25. If you can earn $300 in a night, then the door switches. So then at anything over $300, now you get 75% of the ticket, we get 25% of the ticket. So I was even fair with the tickets. That's very fair. You know, and uh, I also did that for any performance. So like if we did a theater show, like when we did Hamlet, uh, if anyone showed up, they give the name of the performer they came to see. And the performer, we get 75% of the ticket. And uh, no, no, I'm sorry. They would get 25% of the ticket, uh, which is unheard of. So they made $5 a person. So if 10 people came, you made $50 for that one night. If, a, you know, if you could bring 20 people, you just made $100 for that night. So it was an initiative for people to market. You didn't have to sell tickets or anything. They just had to come to the front door and say, you know, my friend is in the play and this is who they are. So if no one showed up, that was, you know, that's, so we, we, we paid you based on your brand value by literally having your brand value be the draw. You know, we did that for comedians that did Saturday nights. We said, look, we'll pay you if people show up. If they show up for you, you absolutely get. And we also did a thing. If you can get 10 people to show up, anybody over those 10 people, we'd give you half the ticket. And then if you could get 20 people to show up, anyone over the 20th person, you would get 75% uh, of the ticket. So the more people you brought, the better your pay was. That's actually, that's a really good system. Yeah. It makes a lot more sense than like, I mean, you know how it is with the, when you're in a band, like they make you sell tickets for a show. Yeah. <laughs> and like when you're starting out, that's like, oof. That's really rough, especially if you don't have that good network. But. Yeah. Also, they go, they go, uh, they go. Here, sell these tickets for fifteen dollars. You can keep whatever. Uh, we need ten dollars per ticket. Uh, you sell it for fifteen. You get to you get to keep five. Great. What are you selling at the door? Ten. What? <laughs> yeah. You're selling. Yeah. <laughs> that that system never made sense to me. You know. It's also <laughs> but, illegal. It's their way of saying you're not paying to play, but at the end of the week. Or the month when it's time to play, they're like, "Oh, you still have ten tickets? You gotta, you gotta give me the money for those ten tickets, or, uh, or you can't perform." You like, well, they're they're taking advantage of teenagers that aren't that don't know well enough to uh, to to do anything. But also, there's a monopoly there. This is like, there's not much that the bands can do because like that system is so built up. It's like, how can you fight it? Well, I disagree with you, but uh, oh, okay, good. You know. Enlighten me. Um, I mean, if you have built up enough of a brand, I'm sure. Well, here's an example. Let's say you, uh, you're you friends with two other bands, right? Each band has four people in it. What's four times three? Twelve. That's right. So if each band member uh, can bring in $200, well, how much money is that? What's two times 12? Uh, Come on. You know that's $2,400. Yeah, 2400 yeah. All right. So, um yeah, hundred dollars. So two hundred dollars a person is twenty four hundred dollars. So that's twenty four hundred dollars for you to rent and market a venue. Now the Vale Levitt in uh, in Riverhead on Long Island is five hundred dollars to rent for a night. So now twenty four hundred dollars. Let's just make an even twenty five hundred bucks. So now you have two thousand dollars left over for your budget for this show. So now you can pay for some uh, newspaper ads for the week before the show happens. Uh, you could also find free advertisement. There's free advertisement all over the place. Uh, you could reach out to do interviews, reviews, and podcasts, radio stations, college radio. Then, uh, you know, you could also 
put that other two thousand dollars into just marketing the event however and wherever you could even put that money into say a savings you're like look it didn't cost us twenty five hundred dollars altogether it only cost us you know fifteen hundred bucks to book market and get this show right but you also sell it you sell tickets for twenty dollars because it's a theater it's a theater show now so if there's let's just say a hundred people show up you just made two grand Minus your 15, so now you made 500. What do you do with that? You could either split it 12 ways, which is basically $200 a person, or you could say, let's put it back in a pile. Now, between the 500 we have saved and the new two grand we have, that's $2,500 that we didn't have to put in. So then we do another show and another show and another show. So now these three bands are basically creating this touring event you know they now you go to connecticut and rent a, rent a hall in connecticut then you go to the city you rent a, a venue in the city there's no way you're going to pay more than two grand for a venue there's no way there's no way i don't think i ever paid more than uh 750 dollars for a night but you have to be it sounds like well we don't want to be promoters well what do you think motley crew did and metallica and all these other bands before there was the internet they put they were promoters yeah they had to run around. They had to book the shows. Then they became friends with other bands. Then bands would do shows together, you know, and the club would just take the bar, you know. My brother did a thing where uh, he got $7 for a $10 ticket, uh, and he got a percentage of the bar. And he'd make $1,000 plus dollars a night. cost them nothing, you know, because he built up the bands. Uh, uh. But anyway, bands do have control. It's just they're so egotistical. <laughs> That it's about them and nothing else. And your success is based on everyone but you. A record All label right. a record label is someone else. That's not you. Yeah. Management is someone else. That's not you. You know, befriending other bands so they put you on shows. That's not you. You know, that's you being being nice and kind to other people and helping other people. But anyway, so yes, I, I don't believe that uh it's just the easy way out. Oh, Fear Factory's playing. Oh, uh, Queensryche's playing. We could we could open up for these bands. How much? Well, you could uh, pay us five hundred to a thousand dollars for these tickets, and then you sell the tickets yourself, and then you get to open up for them. Great. How many bands are on the show? Seven. What time do we go on? One o'clock at night? No, in the afternoon. What time does Queensryche go on? Oh, ten. Yeah. All right. Well, we we can say we open up for Queens, right? You know, and like something something needs to change in the artist brain there because they think if we perform, people will see us and we'll become successful. The other, real quick before we go, the other thing I hate about bands, I'm very passionate about this. The other thing I really hate about bands is say you you do uh, befriend two other bands and you go, hey, let's do a show, and one of the bands says, hey man, can we headline? And you go, yeah, sure, why? And they're like, well, because everyone's going to say they see the stay to see the headliner. You know, or they think they're the best bands, or they're like, we have to be the headliner. Mm. Or and then they don't bring anyone because they go, we're going to win all their fans over, <laughs> but we don't want them to win our fans over, so we won't market it. But then the other bands think the same thing, and then you have a show in front of girlfriends and the bartender. <laughs> You know, and, and that's the craziness is like you have to stop thinking about your success and think about working with people. Because if you work together, you grow together, you rise together, right? Mm. I actually, I just had a a project I was where I'm working on and there was, there was, uh, actually, I probably shouldn't talk about that. Never mind. I'm not going to talk about it. Because I don't think I'm allowed. To, I don't know what I'm allowed to. So I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> I hear nothing. I see nothing. I say nothing. I didn't say anything, so there's nothing I need to cut. That's right. I, I probably could talk about it, but I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it's good because cause I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> oh, fine. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. So that that's uh that's it. That's, uh, yeah. that's all I got to say for you. Unless you have another question or something, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure I could come up with one, but I don't feel like it. Good. good. No. No, good. that was good. That was a good that was a good podcast. You uh you especially that little bit at the end about the band advice. I'm gonna listen back to that quite a bit and pick it apart because that was that was some good shit. Well, that's one hundred 
percent entrepreneurial brain 101 i like it yeah. i love it <laughs> well yeah. uh i guess all we have to do is just tell people where to find you and uh then we'll fuck off all right excellent uh you can find me at make a right left here.com that's make a right left here.com okay and <laughs> Yeah, I already know where to find me at this point. I put it all in the show notes anyway. I'm sure most people don't even pay attention when the person actually says where they're going. Now, what, what is your website again? <laughs> MikeJKellyFilmComposer.com All right, excellent. I want you to ask the next 10 people you meet how to spell composer. Hmm. Just random. I want you to be like, how do you spell composer? Huh. And then you figure out why my website is makearightlefthere.com instead of Thomas J. Beleza. That's true. I hope people can spell composer. Well, you're in a marketing business. Uh, I mean, you're in a business that needs marketing 101. So Nike is not spelt uh, N-I-K-E-Y, right? So what, what do you remember about Nike the most? The check mark. What's Nike's real website? Justdoit.com. <laughs> Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, so. Though you can write Nike.com, you know, but uh, they have the multiple. Like I have multiple. You could put ThomasJBeleza.com, but make a right left here.com is uh, the one I market because it's easy to remember. You know, I have another client. Their band's name is Angels on the Battlefield, right? But their website is On the Wings of Dragons. Everyone can spell those words. Interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, take that in advisement. Okay, I, I actually have been really regretting my web website. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I would I was thinking I should probably try to change my domain. <laughs> make it a uh, Mike to the Kelly. <laughs> maybe, maybe after we stop recording, we can brainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I had fun, man. This was exciting. All right. Take care. Oh, you take care. Ready and...